Hi, my name is Femi Redwood, and I'm chatting with New Jersey Senator Cory Booker for a Radio.com check-in to celebrate Black History Month. First off, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Femi. It's great to be on. Thank you uh, for this chance to talk about uh, Black history. Yeah, a lot of Black history to get to. Uh, so you were the first Black senator from New Jersey. Tell me about your childhood. Specifically, what did you think you would be doing at this point in your life? <laughs> Definitely not this. Um, look, but I, I had parents that raised me to feel this deep sense of appreciation to history. As my parents would tell my brother and I growing up that, you know, my father, in fact, growing up in New Jersey, he'd be like, boy, don't walk around this house like you hit a triple. You were born on third base. <laughs> um, because my father and mother, you know, have that black Southern uh, roots go back in, going back into slavery. And they made my brother and I very aware of all of the sweat and tears and blood and, and sacrifice that went into giving us the kind of upbringing we had. As my parents told me, you can't ever pay it back, but you got to pay it forward. So I didn't know what I was going to do with my life, but I knew what the expectation was from my parents, which was to be a part of the continuing struggle for America. As my dad had told me when I you know, graduated from uh, yet another college with another degree, he's like, boy, you got more degrees in the month of July, but you're not hot. Life ain't about the degrees you get. It's about the service you give. And so I knew that that was my calling, but I just never imagined it would be in politics. I thought it, I, as a, you know, when I finally graduated from law school, my dream was to go into the kind of legal work that helps right. to advance justice in this country for people that often can't afford lawyers. Before we jump into college, what was that defining moment for you as a child when you realized the reality of Black America looks very different from our white counterparts? You know, I so my parents literally had to get a white couple to pose as them in 1969 to buy a house in the town I grew up in, Harrington Park, New Jersey, because they would kept getting steered away from real estate agents who wouldn't show them homes or would lie to them and tell them homes were sold. And so my parents, uh, thanks to the Fair Housing Council of Northern New Jersey and a lot of great activists, black and white, ended up integrating the town. And so you, 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 I don't know the moment, but I know that my childhood began to have this understanding that things were different for me than a lot of my other, uh, other the boys and girls I went to school with. And whether it was their comments about me being so t different from back then when I had hair or skin color, that difference was always with me. But I think the more that I still remember being scared when my parents saw how big I got, I was over six feet tall in the seventh and eighth grade. And they knew that the world would start treating me um, as a threat and as uh, that people's fear of me would cause them to do things. And mm -hmm. I, I remember getting those, that counseling as a boy that I couldn't do things like other kids were doing in the mall, cutting up, running around. And then I started having, unfortunately, experiences that um, gave truth to what my parents were saying. Even as a kid, I remember being accused of things, being followed in malls or jewelry stores. Or, and then when I started driving, it became very stark that their lessons and warnings uh, were, were very real. How do you not uh, get angry about that now? Because I think if if I were in that position, I would be so angry right now where I just I don't know how productive I could be. So how do you just not let that hold you back? Well, those emotions are often valid and real. I, and I remember very hurtful things that happened to me, encounters with police and more that did make me feel angry and uh, but I was blessed to grow up with two parents who believed in the radical love uh, that was preached by everybody from Martin Luther King to Mahatma Gandhi. And they wanted me to lead with love and empathy and compassion. They thought anger was a productive emotion if it was used and channeled for justice, but it, they knew the dangers of those kind of emotions burning you alive. And so they taught my brother through the arts. And, you know, I remember reading great works of um, American history, black literature, people from, you know, with my mom, uh, books from the in Invisible Man to uh, Roots and having conversations about um, those texts and the lessons. So I feel like I grew up with this great spiritual grounding in love, but, but didn't shirk from 
the, the, the wretchedness and the pain and the uh, hurt uh, and the trauma from, our, from the past. And in fact, they didn't want my brother and I to be Pollyannish and always optimistic. They wanted us to find a deeper understanding of what hope really is, as I would learn later here in Newark, probably best exemplified by a hero of mine that lived up the block from me, is that hope is the active conviction that despair will never have the last word. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted me to stare at the darkness uh, um, uh, uh, unflinchingly, but still decide not to add to that darkness, but to be light, choose light and love. That's actually the perfect segue into my next question. You um, went to Stanford, you were Rhodes Scholar, Oxford, Yale. When you graduated, you could have gone into the private sector and made a ton of money. Instead, you went to Newark and opened up a legal clinic for low-income families. And I'm assuming this was an act of love for community. Did any of your friends or family try to talk you out of that and tell you, make the money, worry about community later? No, quite the opposite. I still remember my mom when I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. Uh, she asked me a question from the Bible. She's like, uh, she told me the story of the talents, which is a, one of Jesus's parables about mm -hmm. a, a guy who took the talents that his master gave him, hid mm -hmm. them right. and made decisions out of fear, not faith. And I remember my mom challenging me and saying, I want you to do what you would do if you knew you couldn't fail. What would you do? I want you to do that. And it was this incredible nurturing love that my parents gave me to make uh, uh, the most courageous decision for what would make me feel fulfilled. And um, I moved into the neighborhood I live in now, which has uh, um, made a lot of transformations in the neighborhood I live in. But even now, still, it's one of the lower income neighborhoods in our state. And um, then it had a lot of violence, a lot of high rise public housing projects. And uh, I, I have this belief uh, that, that faith is knowing that no matter what, when you jump into a new experience, when you come to the end of all the light you know, faith is knowing you, if you're gonna find solid ground when you step forward or right. the universe will teach you, send you people to teach you how to fly. Right. And I moved into this neighborhood. I always say I got my BA from Stanford, but my PhD on the streets of Newark. Mm -hmm. I thought I was coming here to help. And what I ended up happening was I feel like I got saved, that I met these incredible people who changed my life, who, who sent my life on a much different direction. I still remember these tenant leaders who became some of my greatest teachers um, who told me to get into politics. Um, but um, in many ways, this has been uh, my courage to leap into something new and risky uh, has, uh, for my own uh, sense of life mission and life purpose, it has bared fruit that I couldn't even imagine. I love that. Uh, when you got into, when you were first elected into Congress, you at that time were, uh, it was a predominantly white Congress. Um, you being the first black person from New Jersey, when you were walking into that white space, did you feel like there was this thin line where you wanted to represent the community you were from, but you don't want to be too black because it's often the line that we navigate is, you want to be yourselves, you want to represent our community, but like, you don't want to be too black. Yeah. So I, I tell you, I've, I've having grown up in an all, you know, white, mostly white community and, um, and, and going to schools, having parents that worked as my dad was the first black salesman hired by IBM in the entire Virginia area. And my, both my parents sort of, I watched them as being black faces in traditionally white spaces and how they acted. And I just felt this, I had this, these role models who were unapologetically who they were. And gosh, my mom would have been, uh, uh, my mom and dad would have been upset if I just was happy to be there right. and tried to, tried to fit in. They didn't want me ever to fit in. They wanted me uh, to be fiercely authentic. And so I walked into the United States Senate in a special election on Halloween seven years ago or eight years ago, 2013. And my dad had just died that same month, six days before I was elected. And my mom, wise woman that she is with my campaign team said, the last thing we're gonna do before you walk over to be sworn in by Joe Biden, the then vice president, yeah. is we are gonna sit down and have breakfast with John Lewis and have him look at me and, and, and with this unbelievable humility and gratitude, telling me how special it was for him to witness me, not just being the first black person from New Jersey, the fourth black person 
in the history of the, the, the United States of America ever to be popularly elected to the United Senate. Before me, it was Barack Obama, before him, Carol, Carol Mosley Braun, and before him, a man named Edmund Brooke. The only other Blacks that had served in the Senate were the, the ones that came in the Reconstruction era um, mm -hmm. that were appointed by their le state legislature. So the, I knew when I left John Lewis and walked onto the Senate floor to be sworn in, talk about um, gratitude being your gravity. <laughs> I walked onto that uh, floor firmly rooted um, in what it took to get me there, as John Lewis said. Uh, a man who literally bled the soil of the South red yeah. for, for, for me and, it, and made me determined um, that I was going to fully represent uh, my, uh, my lived experience in a body that has had so few people with my lived experience in it. And I, I, you know, I'm proud, like you know, um, Chuck Schumer, who is now the majority leader, me and uh, my friend in the Senate, a guy named uh, uh, Brian Schatz, went to him and not, and we just said, there are too few minorities right. working in this. Like, like what shocked me was not just the fact that I was one of the few black people on the floor of the Senate, um, but that when you looked at the committee staffs and the staffs of senators, you saw very few women and, and people of color in positions of power. And so we said to Chuck Schumer, let's start creating accountability around here, force every senator to, to publicly publish how, their data of their diversity of their staff. And, wow. and Chuck later told me that that got a little pushback from some people. <laughs> but that now every year we see the numbers of women and minorities hired going up because it's not just senators, it's how many people are in the room when it right. happens with right. diverse lived experience. Diverse teams make for better teams as everybody from Harvard Business School to big time consulting firms have shown that in business, in, in the arts, you name it, diverse teams are better teams, right. more successful. So I, will, I, I am not there to fit in. I am there to stand mm -hmm. out because that's what New Jersey wants from me is right. to be my, they elected me, the fullness of me. And, and that's what folks are going to get. You have been very vocal in your support of reparations. Um, you know, we, there was a committee meeting back in 2019, I believe. We heard about reparations a bit on the campaign trail and then you know, I haven't gotten my 40 acres in a meal yet. Uh, so that being said, do you think now that Democrats have both the White House and Congress that there will be some movement on reparations? Well, I hope that when people hear that word, I still think there's a lot of folks, really good folks who, who react to it because they somehow imagine that this is going to be them writing a check for right. somebody else. Um, uh, please just, we should start with the understanding that that word is repair or comes from repair, comes from uh, people who had measurable harm and impact um, um, uh, uh, for us as a country. We've done things like reparations before for Japanese who were interned and their property taken away. We know that there was real economic harm over the years. Uh, in fact, we were a country that had explicitly written into our laws up until the 60s and 70s uh, things that that uh, that took from or hurt economically harmed African Americans. My family story of having to overcome racial uh, 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 segregation and 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 not allowing African Americans to have equal housing rights or the ability to build wealth in their homes. So, I just think that this has got to be something. These wounds that still exist and manifest today that we as a society have the courage to confront and to and to and to fully explore. How do we begin to uh, heal, to address the, the specific harms uh, and, and, and bring about justice? And the bill that I have that is really the House, the Senate companion of the House bill to bring together some of the best minds to really study this um, is really important. And we've actually seen cases within the African-American history in Florida, there's one where, where states did come together and address financially specific harms to, spe to specific people that were injured. So I just think, I just hope we can as a country have the courage to, to, to actually confront this wretchedness of our past mm -hmm. if we're gonna heal from it. When you look back at some of the photos and videos of the insurrection and you see that Confederate flag on the floor, does that, does that give you any hope that we will get there? Because we are still a very divided nation. I think that that was, a moment of defeat for our nation. 
that you had white supremacists, na white nationalists, um, such blatant unapologetic racism and anti-Semitism um, uh, overtake the Capitol. And, you know, it was a great black poet who said, we must, we will face many defeats, but we must not ever be defeated. And I, I think that we have to admit that that was a moment of defeat for our country. I always say, if America hasn't broken your heart, you don't love her enough. And for me, I was, that was one of the greatest heartbreaks I've had in my life to in that, in that in body uh, after the bloodiest war in our history, which they tried to take the Capitol, the Confederates marched on the Capitol in DC and, and were, were rebuffed uh, for that day for people to triumphantly wave the Confederate battle flag uh, in that way. Uh, it motivates me more than I can tell you. Um, and it is also a recognition that, what, as you said, we have a, we have a growing problem. Since 9-11, the majority of our terrorist attacks in this country have been right-wing extremists, the majority of those white supremacists. And that violence is growing and we have to confront it. But we also have to talk about the more insidious version of that, which is the systematic racism that allows us as a people to be comfortable with a nation where no difference between blacks and whites for using marijuana. Right. Blacks are almost four times more likely to be arrested for it. That's not white supremacy. That is implicit racial bias that has infected mm -hmm. so many aspects of our nation that we should not tolerate. So it's not enough to say I condemn white supremacy and to say I'm not a racist. We should say as a society, if racism exists and all of us must take responsibility for being anti-racist. If sexism exists and inequality facing women, it's not enough to say I'm not a sexist. We have to all be champions against that injustice. So for me, the, those, those evils, those twin evils of white supremacy and implicit racial bias and systemic racism, those are two things we have to commit ourselves to dealing with in, in this country. All right, uh, let's end this on a bright note. I am a big believer that behind every man or woman is another equally amazing man or woman, speaking as someone who is absolutely in love with my wife. <laughs> uh, that being said, uh, so I read that your, your partner, actress Rosario Dawson, this is the first time you've ever lived with anyone. How difficult or amazing was that, especially during a pandemic? Are you guys killing each other yet? Yeah, look, I know we're not. It's, it's amazing. I, I think I was a boneheaded guy for a long period of my life that, uh, that did not surrender to the empowering force of, of romantic love. And um, I uh, have much amends to make for my boneheadedness over the years. But I've, I've got a partner who has... Uh, accepted me as I am, flaws at all. And uh, we are in the exciting, I should say, uh, ex experience of living together. And, and it's been with her schedule and mine, uh, I'm up and down into DC and she has right. a busy, her, her career is flourishing right now. But when we do have time here together, it's been a, a, just an enriching experience. Um, and I feel blessed and, and just grateful for God because I am not worthy. <laughs> but <I'm not> worthy. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. Thank you. Are you kidding me? I'm, I'm grateful uh, to talk a little bit about my history, but I hope uh, uh, that I was able to shine a light on all, to all those that we as Americans should be grateful for. This is not a time to reflect on, on Black Americans, but really the, the greatness of our country and the diversity and the, and the contributions that, that so many of our great uh, uh, people have made and African Americans, that history to me has just helped this country to, to know a right. deeper, better, richer justice. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. All the best. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, make sure to like and subscribe and hit that bell for all notifications from radio.com. While you're at it, why don't you check out some of our other great videos?